So I've seen some people online say that this next interview, which you're about to see, is the most hostile interview of all time. So you have a journalist in New Zealand is talking to a conservative politician who just got trounced by the Labour Party in an election. Watch this. After a decade in politics, former National MP Jamie Lee Ross is out of Parliament. The Advance NZ co-leader joins me now. Jamie Lee, you just described yourself as a loser. You are out of National, out of Parliament, out of Botany. Your political career is in tatters. Do you have any regrets? Look, we gave it a good go uh, this time round. Uh, we put together a new party we, in just a few months' time. Uh, we only gathered 1% uh, of the vote. It clearly wasn't enough, but I've enjoyed the opportunity to work with all the people that I have with Advance New Zealand. Do you want to have another crack at answering that? Because I just ask you if you have any regrets. You've just been um, part of a political movement which has been peddling misinformation during the election campaign. Do you have any regrets? No, I think we were asking some hard questions about the direction of COVID-19. If you're asking about regrets throughout the whole three-year term, of course, we could have all done things a lot differently and a lot better back in 2018. But we're here now. Um, we made our bed and we just moved I forward. I want to focus on the strategy. Look, why, why on earth did you get into bed with Billy Tikahika? I could see that there was a lot of growth on social media. There was a lot of growth in the t number of people coming so along and looking at it. purely political ambition. No, I you could sold see, your soul I for could, political I could, ambition. I could see that there was uh, people out there who were asking questions around things that I believe in too, around freedom and sovereignty uh, for New Zealand. And a but, pandemic. No, that is nothing. I've never said that, Tova. You haven't, but he that. has. I've never said that. COVID-19 is a real virus, and we were asking questions about whether the country was going in the right direction. You know exactly what you were doing. You were whipping up fear and hysteria among vulnerable communities. Not at all. If you go and look at the mortality rate of COVID-19 compared to other um, flu epidemics... I'm going to stop. No, I'm not, I don't, I don't so, want to so, hear, so, I don't so, hear any of that rubbish. You can't just what you, give what me you, that and not allow me to answer. Well, so. if you're going to come on, if you're going to come on the show and say things which are just factually incorrect. I can do that, actually. Politics is all, you, all you've known. What are you going to do? What are you going to do after this? I think it's time for a rest. Uh, but look, I've enjoyed um, the decade that I've been in Parliament. I think it's been one where I've been able to serve my community of botany, and I've done that diligently. And the last two years wasn't what I expected when we had election 2017. Uh, but there's a whole lot of characters in the National Party, too, that I think uh, will be looking back at this term and thinking they could have and should have done things a lot differently. Who, you said you do have some regrets from the, the three-year parliamentary term, or perhaps more broadly in your political career. Um, this might be the last time that you're on air probably the last time that we'll invite you on. Are there any apologies that you want to issue to anyone? I think we all in the National Party back in 2018 could have done things differently, and we should have. And that was probably the start of the decline uh, for the National Party. Had we all done things differently, we'd all be in a different position. But it happened, we move forward, and we focus on the future. That's do you, what I'm do doing now. you take now. some responsibility for the drubbing that was served to the National Party last night? Internally... Back in early 2018, I was asking questions about whether the party was too negative, whether we should have been more aspirational, whether Simon Bridges was connecting with New Zealanders. I wasn't listened to internally. That was the falling out I had with Simon Bridges. Over time, it got worse, and it blew out publicly. I was saying back then, though, the National Party wasn't connecting. Tonight, or last night, their 27% was because they weren't offering a vision. They weren't offering hope to New Zealanders, and Jacinda Ardern did. Why did you stand down in botany? Because all of the conversations that we had, you were still convinced that you were somehow going to win that seat. People have described you as a narcissist. It did almost seem like a kind of narcissistic belief that you could win the seat that was obviously going to go to Christopher Luxon. Why did you stand down? You're just rolling out all the terms, aren't why you? Did you sta why did you stand down? I wanted to focus on the nationwide campaign with Advanced New Zealand. We had 62 brand new candidates and I was doing that. Had I stayed in botany, I probably would have taken so much vote off Luxon that Labour would have won the seat. So I guess my final gift to the You're National dreaming, Party was, was, was giving them Christopher Luxon. All right, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Former National MP Jamie Lee Ross. That was incredible. Now, that, in my opinion, is how a journalist should talk to a politician. That's how it should be done. It should be a relationship where you hold them accountable. That's your main job, to get answers. There's an old saying, I think I heard it first from Jank Uger of TYT, you need the media to be the watchdogs of the government, not the lapdogs of the government. 
That's totally true. As Glenn Greenwald says, it should be an adversarial relationship. That's how you should approach it in every situation. Now, U.S. media people care about access, I think, more than, you know, the media in some other countries, clearly this journalist in New Zealand. And they want to make sure, hey, let me stay on the good side of this politician so that when there's a scoop coming down the road about something, they'll come to me first. And that sets up a terrible situation where you're never really going to call them out aggressively, even when it's deserved. Now, it does happen in some instances if they don't like certain politicians, like media in the U.S. hates Donald Trump. And it's almost like in those situations, not only are they adversarial, it goes beyond that to let's use any and all arguments against him, even ones that suck, even ones that are not related to policy. So it does, there are some media, I break it down like this for the U.S. You have Fox News, which is the propaganda arm of the Republican Party. You have MSNBC, which is the propaganda arm of the Democratic Party. And you have CNN, you have ABC, CBS, the nightly news, and as a general rule, they're, they do propaganda for both parties, the establishment of the Democratic and Republican Party. Not Trump, they don't like Trump, but they will for John Kasich, for example, for those kinds of characters, George W. Bush. So what you don't have is an adversarial media across the board that holds these people accountable. Um... By the way, I also think one of the main differences is in differences is in the US, they only hire people in corporate media who they know won't rock the boat. Every now and then we get lucky like the Wolf Blitzer interview the other day with Nancy Pelosi, but by and large you don't see the people who are in mainstream media rock the boat, and the reason they were hired and then kept getting promoted is because they put the voices that they know will color within the lines in positions of power. In the U.S., if you had a journalist interview Joe Biden like this politician was just interviewed, or interviewed Hillary Clinton like this politician was just interviewed, that journalist would be gone. They'd fire him. So I would love to see an adversarial relationship, a relationship where you hold them accountable for the people. I'd love to see that in U.S. media. And, you know... With new media, you have the potential to get that, but really new media, is, we're just more outsiders across the board, where it's very rare that we even talk to people in real positions of power. You know what I mean? It's very rare. Every now and then it happens, but um, we can learn a lot from media culture in other countries, because I do believe that our media culture is the worst in the world. Um, or that's not fair. I'm sure there are, you know, there are plenty of authority outwardly authoritarian countries that have propaganda that's on another, like, I'm sure North Korea is worse, <laughs> but um, we do have a very unhealthy relationship between the media and politicians, and it's crazy because I don't, they don't really realize it. In fact, they think they're God's gift to this earth. They think they're amazing. U.S. media people, U.S. media elites think they're, like, the best at this stuff. And, you know, all I'd say in response to that is, look at this interview, but also do yourself a favor and read Noam Chomsky's Manufacturing Consent, and you get a good idea of the dynamics that are at play.